What's new? What's new? Welcome back to another music interview. I'm Justin, the floor god. This is the So Who's Up Next podcast, the show where I have curious conversations with my fellow music creatives about their process, music, and creativity. Christian of Santoku Media is absolutely goaded on the camera. Before our talk, I had no clue what it took to make music videos, but after getting a glimpse of some of his processes, I gained a lot of insight, and I think it's something everyone else can learn from as well. My favorite part of our talk, though, had to be when I asked him about a time things went horribly for him on set, to which he replied with this. There was a tropical storm that day. (laughs) Oh my god, bro. So here we are having a guy stand on one of our C-stands because that thing is about to fly over and kill our artist. We're running out of light. While we're filming, suddenly a bunch of cops show up and we're like, okay, that's for us. That's easily the greatest teaser this show has ever heard. And I'm sure you're intrigued. I definitely was. If you want to hear all the details, definitely stick around till the end. Real quick, I also wanted to let you know that I've opened up ad slots here at the beginning and end of the show. Been super active lately on socials and TikTok especially has done wonders for growing the podcast. So if you're an artist or a music business looking to spread the word about your latest release or brand, hit me up for advertising. My rates are super cheap. And once you've got a placement, it's there forever. Podcast content is evergreen. I've noticed that the shelf life is longer than any other digital medium I work in and pretty frequently I get messages from people telling me they found and binged the entire show all I'm saying is get an ad placement with me and you'll have the spotlight for a long time email me so who's up next at gmail.com with the subject line booming because let's be honest that's what your numbers are going to be doing as soon as you promote with me so make the smart money moves email me so who's up next at gmail.com and we'll get to talking now for the show Christian nice to have you on the show Thanks for having me on the show, man. It's, uh, it feels good to actually be uh, on someone else's thing than <laughs> people being on mine. <laughs> That's what's up. But yeah, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? I'm from the Philippines originally. You know, I moved here as a kid and then I grew up in like little old Cali, Florida. If anyone knows about that place or is from that place, I'm sorry. Like <laughs> a little town with like uh, really nothing to do there. I mean, I, to kind of counteract what I just said, I love that place, but there's really not much going on in Ocala, Florida. Yeah. No, I have uh, some family friends who live in Ocala and. Oh, really? Um, yeah. We don't really spend any time outside of their house. It's usually just a, a hangout session, but. Yeah, it's great. People. Exactly. Yeah. What got you started into making music? I was into music as a kid, like every other kid, you know, I was living in Texas for this point in time, but we were in class and we were in our computer lab class. We were watching Brain Pop, like out of all things. Yeah. And they gave us like a free time to go like, oh, look up whatever you want, Brain Pop. And I was like, all right, cool. I found this Elvis Presley, like Brain Pop video. And then it showed me the Beatles. From there, I went down this like rabbit hole of the Beatles and I just loved the Beatles for years. And I still do. That's what got me into like playing music, writing music. I wanted to be the Beatles. You know, that big, like selling out arenas type of thing. And then, you know, like as you get older, like I've learned like other musicians messages like that they put in music. And I wanted to give that back to people is like what some musicians gave to me in terms like in my time of need, you know, like those certain words that they say in their songs. It was just fun. I loved the performing aspect. And if I could, I would go back just to play in a band, just to play live, you know, that's super cool. And what a what an origin story through a bright pop video. That's crazy. (laughs) Out of all things. It'd be crazy if I was still in a band now yeah i mean you were for a little bit right you had that band not Mm -hmm. good enough um you guys dropped an ep around the same time you started the santoku media stuff but before we get into the media i definitely want to know more about the band what was that like for you how did it form and if you're willing why did it disappear yeah of course i used to play in a couple different bands prior to that i played in a pop punk band and then somehow i became the lead singer for a metalcore band i used to do all like the screaming vocals Nice. all the like super raspy stuff at some point like we weren't really getting anywhere our producer at that time was helping us out he wasn't really helping us creatively and then but he's a super cool guy i don't know if somehow he finds this but super cool guy lyrically i wasn't like the most creative i loved what people put out but like i couldn't like creatively put that out too i have a more of like a mental picture in my head versus like a worded picture in my head so coming up with words was like always a challenge for me going from that we broke up i joined another band my friend's band i sat in on one practice and that's it i didn't want to join in or anything i just wanted to like listen to what they're doing and i was like this is pretty cool like so i texted him afterwards and was like yo do you guys need a bassist he's like hell yeah they didn't feel they should reach out to me because they thought i was only a metalcore like musician Mm -hmm. so i reached out to them 
bang, boom. I got the ball rolling. I started asking people if we can play a show. And fun fact, our first show was outside of our hometown because we thought we were excommunicated from our hometown. <laughs> we play, We ended up playing two or three shows before we actually played a show in our hometown. I joined their band and then we ended up playing quite a few shows. Like And like every month we played a couple of shows and we played shows here in Orlando. We got to play and meet some cool people that I'm still friends with now. And they're pretty up there in the music scene, I like to think. Then at some point, we I moved to Orlando to pursue film. It just became like too much, you know, a band, a job, school. The first thing that went funny enough was job. I was working a eight to six in the morning job. Wow. From the six a.m. eight in the morning job, I went to school at 12 p.m. And then I'll be playing shows like every other week. So that became too much for me. And then at some point, like just like booking shows, selling shows, things like that, just it just caught up to me. I was practically my band's manager. So like having to manage a band and be in school and manage the company at the same time, it just caught up to me. And then I was like, hey, guys, I'm leaving. The second I said to leave, they were like, all right, our next two shows are our last shows. Mm -hmm. then that was it that's pretty crazy but overall you had a pretty good run i like to think so yeah i mean i got to play with bands that i never thought i would get to play with i never thought i would get to release music our last show was with a band so to call out my ex we went to a show it was for a band called bad luck we went to their last show like three or four years prior and she was like having a hissy fit whatever, whatever. Well, i was like oh whatever let's leave we dip and i was i was really looking forward to that show mm -hmm. three or four years later we opened up for that band having their first tour in a while so wow. that was pretty good. Yeah, dude, that's that's insane. That's super cool. Making all those connections and being able to be in that space, I can imagine how much easier it made the transition from the music into the media stuff because you, you cover a lot of punk rock, pop punk kind of bands mm -hmm. um, in your lineup. So what got you? I know you went to school for it as well. Like what pushed you into pursuing film more? Honestly, mainly because of like the times we're in right now. With like the digital age it is, anyone can pick up a camera and become a photographer, the videographer, right? Mm -hmm. At the time, I was only a photographer. To step up my game, everyone has to be a photographer, videographer type of thing now. Unless you're like an amazing photographer and that's all you do, cool, good for you. But coming from like a younger standpoint and like you're going into this world where anyone could pick up a camera, anyone could like offer like 300 bucks music video, done. Like mm -hmm. I had to be able to step up my game and go from just a photographer to video. And I wasn't planning to go to film specifically. Originally, I wanted to go to Full Sail for like their, I think, digital media marketing class type thing where they teach you everything, like photography, graphic design, uh, film. And it was just like a little bit of everything. And then I realized how expensive that was to go to Full Sail. Yeah. I ended up finding the school I went to called First Institute. And they just taught me all the basics I needed in like 11 months or something like that. Quick course. And I went through it. They taught me everything I needed to know. And then I got some cool ships on the way too so i learned everything on that that's super dope and just building those skills over time definitely mm -hmm. you know just helps build your credibility in your work eases maybe the process and actually making things like music videos or the graphics that you do or even the, the promo videos from you have one with like a steakhouse that you did a mm -hmm. while ago that reminds me a lot of like what peter mckinnon does with his b-roll yeah um yeah definitely see that influence there big shout out to peter mckinnon he's a freaking gangster on the camera bro it is for real. <laughs> but but yeah, let's talk about how you come up with music video ideas. Before that, though, we need to establish how you met up with these bands like Ivy Paint, Cold Subject, things like that. So how do you approach bands to work with them? Part of it is like they reach out to us. And then the other part of it is like... I do cold calls like crazy. Mm. It really helped coming from a band aspect to be able to meet bands. For example, we just had Years Off My Life on the show. And when they first like debuted as a band, we were there the at their first show. And I actually opened up for them. We just met casually like before the show started. And they were like, hey, our photographer just dropped. We see you have a camera. And I just happened to be walking around with a camera at the time. Huh. Can you take photos for us? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've never done it before, but fuck it, you know? Yeah. Playing a lot of those shows and playing with a lot of bands, you get to meet like a lot of people and then like you just like build a reputation with people. That's exactly how I also met Ivy Paint is they were playing a show. I hit up every band on that bill and I was like, hey, I'm a photographer. I'm doing deals for this whole like, I think they were doing like a summer jams type thing. There was like 12 bands or 12 bands per stage and they had like three or two stages going on. I forgot. Oh, wow. I remember there being a third column. So that was going on. It was all local bands. And I hit up every band on the bill. 
and was like, yo, I'm a photographer, yada, yada. Ivy Paint ended up liking the shots I took for them. We stayed friends and stayed connected. And I'm actually having them later on today for the cookhouse again. Oh, nice. And same thing for Cold Subject. I actually played a show with them and also took their photos at the same time. A lot of it was really beneficial for me to come from a music standpoint and be able to go into this next world where I already know so many bands compared to if like, let's for example, one of my friends from my studio that I work with, all of them are super green to like the band world. So if I were to push them into the world and like, hey, you know, figure it out, it would be a little more challenging unless they were like a super outgoing person and just talk to everybody. Mm -hmm. I definitely was blessed to have that background before I started doing band photography and doing music videos. It's also, I think, pretty cool that you not only open for these bands, but then also, you know, work for them as well at the same gig. So that's just more exposure on two different levels, which is yeah. genius, I think. If you could like consciously set stuff up like that in the future, that sounds like a, a really good strat to me. But let's talk about the actual music video content. One of my favorites that you've produced was the melatonin video for Ivy Paint. <laughs> um, the premise, I think, was super fun. The little voiceover dub at the beginning was interesting as well. Because it's not every day you get a full-fledged, or I mean, as much of a, a narrative as you can get into a music video like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do you come up with ideas like this? Is it all you? Is it the band? Or is it like a mix of both? How does that work? Our college taught us a lot of run and gun tactics, a lot of guerrilla tactics when it comes to film, mm. which sounds like insane, like some sort of like Al Qaeda type thing, you know, <laughs> they taught us like a super like DIY type of things. And like you learn to like do things really outside of the box compared to the traditional standpoint of film. And I love the way film does things. I love the structure. I'm a very organized person. Like if, well, probably not right now, but normally if you were to see my room, it's like so organized to a point I seem like a serial killer. Like it's insane. <laughs> Something my current director of photography, uh, Alex, he disagrees with me is that every music video should have a narrative and also the artist shouldn't be so hands on with it. Hmm. And that's a normal like film or like Hollywood standpoint on a lot of like music videos. I really wanted to do things where it's like coming from a band perspective, like I knew people would have their own vision and I wanted to be able to work with them to be able to execute that to make it look perfect for the like screen. When it comes to certain music videos and ideas, I will sit down in a meeting with the band and be like, what's your idea? All right, cool. I hear them out. And normally prior, I'll listen to the song. I'll jot down a bunch of notes. I'll be like, all right, so here's my idea. We'll normally mix it in together. Normally my biggest goal is to turn whatever their idea is into video, whether it's like saying, hey, you know, that wouldn't really translate well or hey, that'd be great. Let's do it like this. So I try to be very equal playing fields with them when it comes to making a music video. Cause like, yeah, I would be the expert here, but this is your baby. This is your music. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to communicate that well to their fans. That makes sense. You know, I would think it would be probably best practice to incorporate um, as many details or, or have a good mix of both your ideas and whatever the band wants to do as well, just to make like a more cohesive project. Cause you know, your equipment, your style, they know their sound and their vision, you know, so trying to combine that juggling that also seems like a lot of work. I'm also very curious about how much exactly is done in your pre-planning stage. Cause I know you mentioned that you do a lot of guerrilla filmmaking, just kind of run and gun, as you said, with the film. Yeah. So do you walk in with like a storyboard or is it more more of just here's the idea let's find out on the spot how to execute it what's unique about my company like i like to think is that we are a production company versus freelancers mm. a lot of freelancers have a lot of like free movement so they can like fluidly just work through a lot of things that also comes at a cost mm -hmm. We like to do things a lot traditionally while being able to work in this new space with freelancers and type of thing. Mm -hmm. We want to do things in a structured manner where it's like, you know, we have a grip team, we have a gaff team, we have our director of photography, we have a first AD. And if you ever see a lot of bands now, they'll work with freelancers who are just running around with a gimbal. And that's essentially how I was taught how to do film from school. And yeah, like I can set up a lighting system. I can do like this, this and this for like, what, like 600 bucks. But like, I want to give them like almost like movie quality music videos. Mm -hmm. To do that, I need a director of photography. I need first AD. Like I can't be like focused on multiple things. I need people helping me out. Yeah. Like since we do take that standpoint on music videos, I know me do actually take about like three weeks. I, I try to tell them, give me like three weeks of pre-plan so we can find the location. We can get like all the gear together. I can find a crew who wants to work. And then, yeah, I do go through and storyboard it. And then I don't normally pitch it to the band and be like, hey, these are what the shots look like. 
Mm -hmm. and I'll go to my DP and be like, hey, these are my shots is what I want. And then that's when Alex shits on my face and it's, yo, that's (laughs) not going to (laughs) work. I'm like, ah, shit. Oh, no. From there, I I work with Alex to be like, hey, you know, what will be feasible to be able to pull off what they want? What makes it tricky is that freelancers are able to charge like, what, $800,000 for a music video. We're normally just skimming the teeth of like, the cap of our budget because we try to introduce Hollywood aspects or cinematic aspects into the music videos that normally would cost a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So what makes it difficult is that we have a crew, a team, and then like it's sometimes it's hard to pay them. So it's I have to get interns out and it's just like it becomes like this weird, tricky, like balanced budget thing for us. But we always hope for the best. And then like sometimes when we do like show up at location, normally we want to scout location. We want to look at the location Mm -hmm. traditionally since we can't like rent out on the budget, like to see the day before or like go in pre-plan, hang out there, check out measurements ceiling like height make sure we can fly like lights super high it just becomes like this is our ideas we show up location all right like let's flip this here uh that's not gonna work uh alex what's happening why is that guy just standing there so it's a lot of on the ball thinking from our original pre-plan to there just because a lot of it sometimes doesn't execute well when you're on a low budget but trying to be a high production company and that definitely is where most of the skill learned and practiced definitely comes into play and, mm-hmm. and from what I've seen, you know, for me, like a big part of whether it looks cinematic or not is not necessarily the camera placement and the shots, but also the color grading and editing and pacing and things like that. All of which I think, I mean, granted, I'm not an expert, but to the average consumer, uh, I think it comes off as definitely cinematic, definitely Hollywood. Um, mm-hmm. And if you are balling on a budget, it certainly doesn't look that way. Um, so you're, yeah. you're, I think you're doing a great job, man, for real. It, it becomes stressful. And I'm, I'm telling you now, I'll be bald before I'm like 35 <laughs> or 30. Oh, and, no. <laughs> you know, I have a good time. And like once the music video is normally done, like you can, we can normally appreciate it really well. Yeah. And I think one of the, just as a content creator or just as a maker in general, it's always so cool to see that finished product and, you know, the fruits of your labor, however long. I know, especially with like music videos and stuff, it's not always a one day shoot or maybe it's Mm -hmm. never a one day shoot. You know, it's a whole process. You got to take the time to get all the shots and maybe read Mm -hmm. stuff or um, get the lighting right. And that takes a lot of time. So you mentioned just now, you know, you're going to be going bald with all this stress uh, pretty soon. (laughs) But have you ever had something go like catastrophically wrong on set or? Oh, my God. (laughs) So (laughs) our last music video we did, it's for a girl named Verona. Verona Rose. I'm sorry, Verona. I don't know if that's a real name or not, but I'm pretty (laughs) sure. I don't know. That's that's all I've ever seen, like on all of her social media. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Super sweet girl. Um, She's from West Palm Beach and she completely funded her music video by herself. Like she she worked for like weeks and then hit us up and was like, hey, here's my, you know, budget. With the budget she had, we had a a lot of favors when that came to like getting a cinema camera getting like we got i think like six thousand twelve thousand dollar lights on set nice so we filmed two days with for that music video one on green screen one on just like like a random spot so day one day one wasn't bad we got green screen yada yada like we had some challenges because it was literally like the size of a like a house garage but like slightly bigger so fitting a car in there and like i would say like four or five crew members and then like these big lights it (laughs) It really didn't work out the way we exactly wanted it. But, you know, like I said, you know, pulling on a budget, we had to pull a lot of favors and like I knew the studio owners and I was like, yo, can you guys help us out? And they're like, yeah, 300 for the day. And like, if you know studios, 300 for a day was nothing. Day one wasn't bad. Day two. Oh my God, man. Let me tell you, that was insane. First of all, she wanted us upright piano and upright pianos are huge yeah. and they're heavy. Uh huh. And <laughs> so we rented a U-Haul. They didn't have box trucks. They only had a van. So it didn't have a ramp. So not only did that hold us up, we show up to the location where the free upright piano was. And let me tell you, that thing was cursed. <laughs> every time I worked on the music video or every time like I thought about that music video, I swear to God, I was going to have a seizure. I literally sat down one time, started editing it. My heart like clenched up and I was like, oh, I need to sit down. Damn. I swear it was the piano. We show up to location. There was no way to get it in the van, nor did it fit in the van. Mm. We're already like hour, two hours past like set time. And if you're director of photography and your director aren't on set, like what are you supposed to do? Rest of the crew is there. So not only did it not fit, it was heavy as balls. 
we couldn't even get it in for the first place and it was funny is that the guy who gave it to us he was determined to get rid of it like he would be like all right i'll come back i'll come back he leaves and comes back with all kinds of different tools he did it three times and i was like what the f- is this up with this guy yeah and I was like, yo, we got to ditch this thing. Like, we're running out of time. We saw the piano. The piano is perfect. If you guys ever go check out that music video, it's Overthinking by Verona Rose. And the piano in that music video is perfect. It was beautiful. It was made back in the 19th century. So it was old. It was a perfect for the music video. And we ended up finding like an abandoned gas station to film at. We couldn't even put it in the car. So we wheel it over there. We get the whole crew to come over. Turns out we left her outfit and her car back at the house. So we had to f- drive back over to the house. Mm. get her car and then we realize we need a generator we can't power our lights now yeah we get one of the guys to go over he gets a generator comes back he was like it's 80 dollars, and i was like Paul. the generator was like a 3000 watt generator cool right 3000 watts one of our lights are 800 other ones 400 it should be able to power it mm. damn thing cuts out every other take and not only did our generator not work there was a tropical storm that day <laughs> oh my god bro so here we are having a guy stand on one of our C stands because that thing is about to fly over yeah. and kill our artist. We're running out of light while we're filming. Suddenly a bunch of cops show up and we're like, okay, that's for us. They completely disregard us. And turns out there's an accident on the side of the road. Guy gets out of the car. He's kind of just bleeding off his face. We have accident, tropical storm, generator's not working. We're running out of light. And we're like, all right, let's get all the shots that we need and get out of here. We ended up not getting all the shots. We ended up going back to Alex's house and we leave the piano there. We just left it in the middle of the gas station. Yeah. Because we couldn't move it. Mm -hmm. And we end up going back to Alex's house. We chill out for a bit and we go back to filming. That's when the hydrotropical storm hits. And here we are outside. Like we're just trying to film a daytime scene in the night. Luckily, we had lights to do it. Mm -hmm. But oh my God, that was insane. And then some random dude came up to us and was like, hey guys, you know, what's up? And like, he's like, yeah, no, I'm friends with Alex, our director, our director of photography. And Alex is like, I don't know who that is. I was like, what the frig's going on? Yo. Somehow we got it together. We finished it. Music video is done. We go to post-production. Post-production, like, we don't have a VFX guy to do this stuff. Not only do we not have a VFX guy, we had one terabyte of footage. I don't have one terabyte of a hard drive to like keep on deck. Yeah. I didn't know how I was going to edit it. That was like 6K highest like bit rate footage. Yeah. I was afraid my computer was going to blow up. Two, three weeks go by. I put together like the base edit without like the green screen. And then I finally convinced Alex to do it. Alex doesn't do it like a week later. And so the like, deadline comes up and I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to learn VFX and how to green screen. How to like make this look at least semi clean. Mm-hmm. And so like in a matter of a couple of days, I learned how to do VFX how to green screen this motherfucker and how to like execute this final music video. Yeah, that was a lot. That's crazy. And so all that with the tropical storm and stuff, that was all just day two? That was all day two. That's yeah. <laughs> that's so crazy, bro. Holy cow. But also, yeah, I man. guess that's just Florida for you. Like, the, yeah. <laughs> the, with the storm. Yeah. But it's also very Florida man of you to be trying to film in that kind of weather. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, dude, dude, that's super crazy. That's super cool. I'm glad it worked mm-hmm. out. I'm glad you're not cursed forever. Let's turn our attention to the cookhouse stuff. Yeah. It's a series you've got. How'd you get that started? Cause I know as a media company, you're probably thinking, oh, we can't just do this one thing. Mm-hmm. How exactly did you come up with the idea for the cookhouse? I had the idea of expanding the company for a while. I wasn't really sure what, cause so we started the company as like one big thing. It was me and one other person who helped me start the company. Mm-hmm. She's up in Tallahassee right now. She's super cool. She's actually in film school now, like the more traditional route. So she helped me start the company back when she was learning. So I was like, hey, you know, you're learning video. I'm learning how to create a company. You want to do this for me. I started the company like really big. We did everything underneath like the umbrella. Family photo shoots. We did portrait shoots. We did bands. We did music videos. We did everything on an umbrella. And realistically, that doesn't work. If you want to be a company, you kind of want to like focus up what you do so you have your niche. So people are like, oh, they're a company that does this. We can go call them for that. Once I kind of like filtered out all the other stuff, the cookhouse like came about. I wanted to be able to give musicians and bands a platform for where they can speak freely. Like Mm -hmm. if you wanted to be on like one of those big interviews, you kind of have to be filtered. You're only given a certain amount of time to talk and they don't do local artists. And coming from the local artist background, I knew how hard it was to promote your music and be able to talk freely about your music. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give that platform for people to, hey, talk freely. I will not filter you out unless you curse. That way, you know, YouTube doesn't take down the video. Right. And I just want to be able to promote people, especially right now where people cannot talk to people, their fans, like after a show, you know, if like you're at a show, 
you go up to their table afterwards where they're selling merch and you talk to them for a bit. I wanted to be able to give that platform where people can still semi get to know the people they're listening to. That's super cool. I think expanding in ways that make sense to you are definitely the way to go because it's not so much like you can follow a script when it comes to media companies, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and I do think having a specialist approach over a generalist one is definitely better probably for the wallet as well as for the branding, you know, because even with like YouTube, right? If you try to do everything as well, you have no niche. People can't find you for that one thing, you know? Oh, yeah. Just another quick thing I was really curious about was where the name Santoku Media come from? What does that mean? So fun fact, I used to be a chef. Nice. I used to work as a, I wasn't the hibachi chef. I was the kitchen chef. Mm -hmm. But I can cook everything they could cook plus a little bit more. Yo. I love cooking till to now. And I was like, you know, I need to make a media company. What do I name stuff? And so I like, I thought about it for a while. I started looking into different names and different things. And then I realized like one of the knives I own is it has a cool name. It's called a Santoku knife. Mm. what it is is just a general purpose knife in the kitchen that can do like a little bit of everything and i was like all right that's kind of cool i wanted the company to be able to do a little bit of everything originally and so just like a santoko knife i wanted to be able to be able to be that versatile while at the same time being useful and so santoko media was created and so i started naming everything underneath that kind of like kitchen restaurant cook type of stuff mm-hmm. santoko knife is like japanese and like asian culture is super cool to me yeah yeah especially being asian i started doing like some plays on that like if you see on the cookhouse there's a the title screens for certain parts is actually the naruto font oh nice i mean i haven't watched enough naruto to know that yeah (laughs) no that's super dope that's that's a super cool little call out to just that culture because yeah like Mm -hmm. especially in the west we've kind of appropriated it but also mm-hmm. in a way that I don't think is bad. You know, it's like a celebration of it. And so just working little bits in here or there, but like over this past summer when I was trying to sell beats, I very much borrowed from that aesthetic as well. Mm-hmm. It's a vibe, dude. Like yeah, <laughs> it bro. looks cool. It's got this uh, appeal for a reason. I got really into big, into like the Asian culture and stuff like that. And right now with, I would say like a lot of Asian artists and Asian people in like Hollywood, it's like, we got to support where we can type of thing. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because it's like, I, I remember maybe last spring taking a class about like race and racism and it was like a lit class but it also applied like we talked about media and representation and things like that asian representation came up it was the first time that i had really thought about yo maybe we need more asian representation because it's like at the time i think uh, crazy rich asians was popping so that was definitely back in my mind but i was like that's kind of uh, an outlier compared to just, uh, I don't want to mm-hmm. say regular films, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. definitely yeah. the wrong phrase, but... Um, I understand just, what you're saying. Yeah, just like non-Asian films. As an Asian creator, I find myself maybe at times struggling to fit in maybe with, mm-hmm. I don't want to say mm-hmm. musical stereotypes, but definitely I don't look the part of like that white indie hipster, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I'll, yeah. I'll never fit that mold. At the same time, I know there are labels like 88 Rising that celebrate, mm-hmm. they have like their Filipino brand, Paradise Rising, which is super cool. Um, mm-hmm. but, but then again, they've carved out that space specifically for that. So when you look to put yourself out there, are there any difficulties you encounter when maybe approaching different people for collaborations or trying to find work or do anything, I guess, like that? I know for sure, like, I personally haven't encountered, like, like, God bless, I haven't, like, encountered any, like, pushback from being, like, an Asian American, like, creator. Mm -hmm. I've found a way to, like, work in a bubble where it's, like, almost kind of free space. At the same time, it's, like, it's not just because, like, I'm Asian American. It's because I am a creator. Mm -hmm. I haven't, like, found setbacks, and I've put myself in places where it's, like, oh, you know, we're all just creators, and it's, like, why does our race really matter and it's really cool because like that's a lot of the band scene there's a lot of like ethnic you know culture in the band scene mm-hmm. like for example who is it uh from orlando meet me at the altar uh all woman all mixed race band i've honestly used being an asian american to my advantage mm-hmm. sort of like just because like there's not many of us being able to surround yourself and like be a part of these little groups of like other asian american creators it kind of helps promote yourself and helps them too if that makes sense yeah just when i see other asians in media you know it's like hey i could be that or i could do that or i can relate Mm -hmm. to that at the very least you know and being able to hold your own ground i guess in your own space that you've created is also really good because then you pave the way you know for others mm-hmm. to maybe follow um no, for inspired sure inspired or, or do whatever they're gonna do so that's another thing is like i want to be able to 
allow, especially like being Filipino, it's like you're expected to be certain things mm. and which a lot of my like more American friends, uh, some of them will understand some of them won't understand. It's just like, why did you do it this way? Why did you do it that way? Well, it's like, you know, I still have expectations as the oldest son, as being a Filipino, Filipino son in general. It's like, there's a lot of expectations put on me. I want to be able to let people know, hey, you don't, you can break the mold of being, being a nurse, for example, mm-hmm. or a doctor or a lawyer. You can do what you want. Just go do it. You know, eventually you just got to take that leap for yourself. Before we get into Christian of Santoku Media's advice for emerging artists and media people, a quick reminder to find Santoku Media on YouTube and Instagram. The whole company makes absolutely banger content, and definitely watch the Cookhouse series on YouTube because your boy's on it, which makes me biased. But the whole series is honestly incredible. It's really cool to get to know artists in the way that Christian conducts his show. It's very fun. Now for some advice. What advice do you have for people wanting to get further into music? I guess to start off with the band scene, just don't be afraid to talk to people. Let's say you're at a show and before the show starts, you see the guy over there. He's probably the promoter. Like you've never spoken to him besides like, hey, can we be on the show? Go talk to him. He's just a normal dude. It doesn't hurt to go talk to him. And like if you create that promoter musician relationship, it will open up doors for you than you can ever believe. Our promoter, we got to know him well and I'm he's still a contact for me now. Like mm-hmm. if I need something, I can hit him up and be like, can you like hook me up? When I was in school, I tried to get him to help me with getting a bigger band as my documentary like project. Kind of fell through. He was still able to like kind of set it up for me. I really appreciate that. And another thing is like work your ass off when you're in a band. Like that's all you can do. Like when that's selling merch, pushing shows, and you're going to want to push shows. Like it's insane how much that is really important to promoters. I mean, obviously, but like sometimes they'll make you pay for the tickets that you don't sell. And that sucks. If you play your first show or your first two shows, whether that's a small show or a semi big show, Try to sell your tickets because if you can show you can sell tickets, they'll book you for any show, whether that's like you sell 15 to your friends, 10 to your family, whatever. And then you buy out the last 20 show. You can sell tickets. They'll book you for any show. So for media, it's another it's the same kind of same thing. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be free to like be afraid to cold call. Talk to everyone and anyone. Be persistent about it. Like right now, I'm like in an email back and forth with this lady, the marketing manager for a band or two bands actually i'm like trying to get her to get her bands on our show Mm. don't be afraid to be a sponge just learn everything you can learn whether that's like just being an intern on set where you're just watching or like puffing it and like helping them carry like light stands everywhere or taking down the heavy light or the heavy hot light be ready to learn like it, when it comes to media, you're always going to learn something. I'm always learning something every day, even as a director and owning my media company. Like someone's teaching me something. 